evening, ladies and gentlemen. In this uh, lecture series, I think we have come to a point when we are going to address a very interesting topic. <clears throat> the topic of relationship between the political executive and the civil service. I think it goes without saying that in the task of state building, we require both a political executive to envision the wishes of the people and a permanent civil service to translate the vision into reality. The relationship between the two, I think, is extremely important for state building. And I think it's also true that the subject of relationship between political executive and the permanent bureaucracy has not got the attention it deserves from political thinkers. I for one think that this relationship is crucial, crucial for the development and growth of a nation, particularly of a young democracy like India. The political executive by design is an instrument of elected government to set policies for the country as a whole. They have these positions <coughs> because they have won the verdict of <coughs> on public policy. Therefore, it is expected that they are willing and able to devise these policies in the best interest of the people. They play a very decisive They play a decisive role in state building. I say state building again because state building, I think, is the craft that is needed for a country like India or for similarly placed countries. In my view, the civil service plays an entirely different role. They implement policy, besides, of course, helping to make it. <coughs> and they bring this expertise and knowledge on the basis of institutional memory and domain knowledge. These are the two things, institutional memory and domain knowledge. In India, generally, the civil servants live their whole life in government. Though, of course, now it's changing. Now, my first hypothesis is that these roles are separate and we must do everything we can to keep them separate. This must be understood by both the players, the politicians and the civil servants. There should not be any confusion. <coughs> if you recall, the shape of the Indian Civil Service was debated very extensively in the Constituent Assembly. <coughs> and at the cost of uh, um, opposition from some of the members, Sardar Patel held the view that we must have an independent civil service. He said in the Constituent Assembly, I think in uh, 19, for October 1949, he said that the Indian Union will go if we do not have a civil service that speaks out its mind independently, we shall not have a united India. If we do not adopt this approach, then don't think of this system. Substitute it with some, something else. <laughs> and as I said, there were opposition. There was opposition from some of the chief ministers, then chief ministers, and some members of the Constituent Assembly. But 
सरदार पटेल हैं इसमें एंड दैट इज वाई टू ऑल इंडिया सर्विसेस द आई पी एस एंड आई एस दे वर एस्टैब्लिश दे वर एस्टैब्लिश फॉर जस्ट एंड फेयर एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन टू सेफ गार्ड दीज सर्विसेस from the vicissitudes of political convergence beautiful language it's used in the constitution from the vicissitudes of political convergence they were commented in the constitution so we adopted a variant civil service a civil service a permanent civil service appointed on merit and having the core values of integrity efficiency objectivity political neutrality and the most important of it all is an ability to transfer its specialized knowledge and loyalties from one elected government to another ability to transfer its loyalty and expertise from one elected government to the other and ladies and gentlemen i think that poses a problem this last feature poses a problem it may not pose a problem in other settled democracies where the mainstream political parties have their set ideologies <coughs> but in the indian scene with the cacophony of uh, ideologies i think the civil service has to play a role like a chameleon and this new phenomenon of uh, uh, coalition governments makes matters much worse <coughs> and even i was a junior functionary in the ministry of home affairs <coughs> some of my senior colleagues are sitting here in the 70s everything was going well <coughs> and suddenly the prime minister thought of declaring the state of emergency <coughs> after the promulgation of emergency well we started looking for i was i was told by the home minister then home minister to draft a paper draft a white paper on the for the justification of emergency the white paper was called why emergency so i did a thorough research on the writings and speeches of jay prakash narayan and picked out the most objectionable parts and gave a draft the draft was edited by my joint secretary secretary and finally it was tabled in the parliament came 19 came 1977 <coughs> emergency and and we had a new government all the civil servants took a u turn including me we started looking for instances of excesses committed during the emergency <laughs> i tendered papers in shah commission and i think this sort of a situation is being faced by hundreds or thousands of bureaucrats okay. in the country there's another problem the problem mm -hmm. is of the indian state as we all know the indian nation came into existence because of the constitution not the other way around <coughs> we have a union government and we have state government or a coexisting sometimes they are ruled by different political parties or different political coalitions the members of the all india services do you believe they have to change their dance steps very frequently shuttling between the central and the state governments this is the reality I don't think much thought has gone into this. I will um, request Mr. Vinod Sharma to tell us a little about.
about whether something has been really, you know, thought in literature about this sort of a state of affairs that we have. Now we go back. We go back to the time of independence. Some of you will remember <coughs> that in the beginning there was some sort of an internal consistency in government. A synergy between the political masters and the civil servants. And this internal consistency, I call it internal consistency, was based on mutual admiration and respect. <coughs> the civil servant respected the political leaders for his leadership qualities. He had a mass following. He knew the pulse of the people, what the people needed. <clears throat> he was purposeful and pragmatic. And the politician, he respected the civil servant for his impartiality, for his integrity, for his knowledge of the subject. And the politician <laughs> could rely upon the bureaucrat for right advice and faithful implementation of policies. There was a mutual respect. This state of internal consistency started from the time of independence and it was there, I think, till the end of 60s or the beginning of 70s. There are so many instances which come to my mind where this internal consistency played a role in the policy making and policy implementation. There are so many examples. I can give you a very elegant example, of course you all know about it, and that is the great green revolution of the 60s. I remember, I was in the field at that time, and I remember that the politician and the bureaucrat and the scientist, of course, they sat together decided on the policies and it was implemented at the ground level by both the politician and the bureaucrat. There was hardly any case of victimization. There was no case, at least in my state, of any political transfers. No district magistrate or no functionary was transferred on the basis of political favoritism or victimization. So, when the civil servant and the politician started working together, it was expected that they will, their respective roles will be defined and further refined. <coughs> the deepening of democracy required role definition, which unfortunately did not happen. There was no role definition, even today, there is no role definition. Merely saying that the politician makes decisions and the babus implement them is not enough. It leaves room for arbitrariness and slot. And this is exactly what happened. It went on, went on very well for a couple of decades and thereafter something snapped. It didn't happen abruptly, it happened gradually. There was a gradual introduction of the element of temptation in governance. A new element was introduced and that was greed, personal greed. The impulse came from extraneous sources. <coughs> but something happened. It was, it was very gradual. It was like uh, the syndrome of uh, boiling a frag, frog. If you put a frog in boiling water, it will jump out. 
but if you put him in cold water and slowly heat the water, then it will boil. That is how what happened. Gradually, I've seen it. Some of us older people, we have seen it. Trust turned into distrust. And mutual respect turned into uneasy coexistence. Together, the bureaucrats and the politicians brought down the whole monolithic structure like a house of cards. And today, ladies and gentlemen, today the situation is that distrust has reached such a stage where civil servants are knocking at the doors of the judiciary to put <coughs> the political executive, the prime minister and the chief ministers to transfer and post officers. If there was internal consistency, this wouldn't have happened. <coughs> So my second hypothesis is that a honest and effective civil service cannot exist in a self-seeking political system. Somnath Chatterjee, your speaker, he said once, he said, you can't expect good governance from my politics. And I think the reverse is equally true. An inspired political executive cannot tolerate corrupt administrative setup. Today, what is the situation we all know? We have seen it. Every day in the newspapers it is appearing. The ministers are increasingly suspicious of the performance of civil servants. The ministers <coughs> do not want to take the blame of what happens in their ministries and departments. The civil servants, they are feeling insecure. We have seen instances where uh, even secretaries are transferred at the instance of ministers for disagreements. Today, I, I don't hold a brief for either. But today, the relationship between the two is aptly described by an anecdote. That this man, he went to the zoo and he saw a lion and a monkey in the same cage. He was amazed. So he asked the zookeeper as to how they get along. The zookeeper said, Famously, they usually get along famously. Sometimes there is a disagreement and then we have to get a new monkey. <laughs> now the monkey may be old or new, but the thing is that this internal consistency which I hold very uh, high in priority, it is affected. There is an erosion. <coughs> Finally, I would just say that my third hypothesis is that there is a very strong need to restore this internal consistency. And this cannot be done unilaterally. This has to be done by both the parties. Somehow, the political leaders of all hues and civil servants of all services should come together on a table and try to generate this sort of, some sort of consistency. How this can be done? Who will take the initiative of bringing the two together on the table? The media? The civil society? I don't know. We'll seek the answer from our learned speakers. Thank you very much.